flight is cancelled, in which case I'd still be in New York. Um, but luckily, they were able to rip, a, uh, rip one of the control units out of one of their planes. And it cost them a million quid, all told, apparently, to get us here. So the lesson is, uh, don't test your things in production. Test them early, <laughs> and then you don't have a million quid to spend on getting people there in a production situation. Plus, they had to deal out like a gazillion air miles to everybody when they got here. So, long story short, <clears throat> I'm finally here, and um, I will now, instead of giving like, the introduction to what some of our experiences are, I'll give them sort of wrap up. And hopefully, this will provide some kind of a synthesis rather than an introduction of all the very interesting technology that you've seen so far. And because we've now already had some tech sessions, I might abuse that a little bit to give to squeeze in a quick demo of deployment as well. So that's me, blah, blah, ego slide. So I'm, by background, a, a technical uh, person, done a lot of uh, high performance software development, um, been on in the dev and the offside, and when I'm not uh, being VP of products at ZB Labs, I try to keep myself busy with uh, open source stuff. So I work on specifically a couple of libraries, JFlowers, and do the Scala puzzlers. And, and as of now, I'm uh, on PC. I also talk at a bunch of conferences. So if you're a DevOps or maybe a Java one this year, you might see me. Um, it's the company I'm here for. Put that slide in as well because we're a sponsor. So, um, ZB Labs, we're based in Boston. This is why I just come from the US. Um, we have customers all around the world. We do deployment automation, or essentially continuous delivery automation too. Uh, what we'll focus on in the demo is deploy it, uh, and release something, application release automation solution, but um, we'll come back to that in a bit. I think the more interesting thing perspective of what I can sort of hopefully teach and give you some uh, some experience is based on the fact that what we're seeing a lot of people trying to do right now is move towards continuous delivery. It's very big on the 2013, 14 agenda for a lot of companies. I've spoken to a few people recently who say, oh, we've been doing this for years, in which case, great, that's fantastic. Of course, we fully believe in that. But um, what I'd like to focus on is having spoken to a whole bunch of large and small companies have this vision, this is where we want to go, they're then kind of faced with the question of, well, what do we do now? How do we get there? And um, of course, in an enterprise, it's not quite as easy as you know, hanging Jez's book up on the wall and saying, this is how to do it. You actually have to get stuff done. You have to figure out what you need, what the prerequisites are. And some of these challenges are what I'd like to focus on uh, and hopefully give you a couple of you know, easy points that you might consider is, okay, if we're going to try and go here, these are some things maybe we should consider initially, um, and then help us plan our path to this. And of course, this should be not uh, what's coming up today. This is what you, oh, can't type anymore. So that happens already. See. Right, there we go. Okay. Instant agenda adjustment there. All right, let's start off with a quote. Continuous delivery is a set of patterns and best practices that can help software teams dramatically improve the pace and quality of their software delivery. So I think that's the Wikipedia definition, for those of you who didn't know it. Um, and, and we're basically seeing that you know, a lot of people, this is an interesting survey we did on <coughs> application release trends. Those of you who haven't seen it yet, I think we might have some of the infographics here. You can download them. They're a nice thing to hang up. Great thing to show your manager if you want to convince them that it's time that, to allow you to play with more cool tools. Um, basically, we're seeing that this is a big thing on people's agenda. I think this is the natural successor to kind of continuous integration and to the private slash hybrid cloud initiatives that have occupied most organizations in the past couple of years. And obviously, we're, we're seeing those two spaces grow together. Uh, the deployment is the obvious next one in the middle. So. Why are we seeing this, I think? Well, it's fun, obviously. Um, it's cool. It's the really hip thing to do right now, you know, continuous delivery and what the LinkedIn's and the Facebook's and the Google's, those kind of tech companies are doing. And of course, that's, you know, if, you're, if you're an ops person, you like the, the data center, the, the million node data center, the Netflix, if you're a, it's the release manager, delivery person. This is, a, I guess, one of the things to aspire to. And yeah, as I said, all the cool kids do it. I mean, this is uh, all the big tech companies and I think, that, to be honest, this is a point bearing in mind. Those are tech companies with huge amounts of technical resources. Uh, so they, they're basically developers or, or DevOps people only. So we have to bear that in mind as one of the challenges. More realistically, I think, and we're seeing two 
main trends pushing this accelerator time to market and a little bit it's all of the above. So I think that the real answers are somewhere around uh, it accelerates time to market and all of the above. And I think this is an interesting one because this is a message that resonates very well with the business as well. It's not just quote unquote the technical thing um, which you know we're doing to make things more efficient and more fun but it's actually supposed to have visible uh, improvements in terms of how we can serve our customers. And I think that's getting very important right now. Um, I think everybody has a smartphone. I don't even need to embarrass people by asking. Um, now we're used to a culture of application or software service delivery, basically, where it's just you know tap a couple of buttons, poof, there it is, works, and it updates itself. And it, you know that's the kind of culture, that's the kind of culture of IT consumption that we're seeing. And if you're an organization that doesn't have the latest and greatest mobile app, then you're you know, somewhere, somewhere a CIO is panicking because you don't have this app. So I think we're really seeing a, a strong push towards accelerated time to market. And of course, every mobile app has its service line component and so on and so forth. So who here does that job? Show of hands. A whole bunch of people. Should be an easy one then. Another quote. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery, there's that phrase again, of valuable software. Anybody recognize this? Ah, very good. Thank you very much. This is principle number one from the Agile Manifesto. So I'll be really, I can stand here and say, if you're not doing this, you're not doing Agile. That's a bit brutal, and it's not really true, of course. But people tend to forget this. Agile, the Agile Manifesto is based on this foundation that this is what we're really trying to achieve. It's the most important thing, in fact that we should all be trying to achieve. So if we think that we're done because we have continuous integration, we're putting code in a repo every couple of days, then we maybe need to think again a little bit. And I, mean, I think this is the fundamental challenge here. What's the value of your source code if it sits in a code repository? I would contend that the value of code in a source repository is very, very small. It's zero, but it's close to zero. Until it's in use by a customer, skipping ahead too much here. Until it's in use by a customer, until you actually have people using your software and benefiting from the features and hopefully giving you bucket loads of money in return, there's not much benefit to having it in the first place. So we've all read the book. I mean, you've seen the chart, you've seen the movie. This movie doesn't exist, actually. I just thought it was fun. Um, the main question is, of course, how do we get there? How do we get to our happy customer? Because that's what we're all supposedly here for. We're trying to make our customers happy. All right, racing through this. All right, so much for the for the picture of you know, what we're really trying to do here. But as we all know, if we try to do, those of those of you who've been through this already will have, I'm sure, recognize some of these things. Try to do things something like continuous delivery in an enterprise has a number of challenges. Let's put that way, that we need to uh, navigate uh, before we can get there. So I think. Again, I mean, not all will apply to every situation, uh, but I think some of them are, are very, very common. So the first very obvious one is the big applications. Uh, I had a long discussion with the guys from ThoughtWorks about this. They said one of the big challenges they see is that you know, the idea of doing incremental pipeline kind of base deployments is great, but if you've got this humongous app of 4,000 components all glued together in one big ball that don't compile without each other, and it takes like four hours to compile, you're going to have some, some severe kind of upper bounds on your ability to be iterative and flexible. And I mean, yeah, this is still in a lot of cases, this is uh, quite, quite common. Um, low levels of automation. <coughs> now, I don't think there's anything in, in continuous delivery in principle that says you have to automate everything. Of course not. Um, it's just that continuous delivery largely is based on a repetitive execution of a whole bunch of tasks over and over again, hopefully quickly. And as we all know, a gazillion studies have shown, humans are just really bad at that kind of activity. That's why we invented machines in the first place. Um, who is it? Someone, Henry Ford, I think, had a great quote that is, um, if you need a machine and don't buy it, you'll find out you've paid for it, but don't have it. So, you know, it's not shying away from this. This is something we need to address. Um, contended environments. Well, I'm really glad that I'm now coming after the puppet talk because I think largely most people will know what the default solution or certainly a very good solution to this problem can be. 
Um, we see a lot of organizations where there's four test environments, or three, or seven, or some fixed number, and they're very complicated to set up, and they have all these weird connectors, and some of them run slightly different software from each other, and the versions are not always quite the same. And uh, there's like 20 teams, and they all have to use these environments to get their stuff tested, or performance tested, or whatever the environment might be doing. And yeah, that, that doesn't work very well. They get cluttered, uh, tests run over, everybody gets backed up, uh, the environment gets messed up, takes ages to reconfigure, and so on. And in fact, I think this was identified as the number one cause of deployment failures. Not really the app being broken or anything, just the environment being garbled. Um, so if we can get away from that, and of course, if you're trying to run pipelines, like multiple applications, with lots and lots of different testing phases, this becomes incredibly problematic if they're all bottlenecked on a couple of environments. So the ability to have um, on-demand environments to a known good standard becomes quite important. And then, of course, release management. Uh, that <laughs> the elephant in the room. Um, yeah, it's, it's great to draw this chart and say, look, look, you can go all the way to production. How nice, that's easy. And then you go to most organizations and you have CAD meetings. And I, lots of people here are probably doing ITIL. And you have all these, everybody needs to sign off and all this kind of stuff. And that doesn't make continuous delivery impossible, of course, because some of those checks can hopefully be automated or some can be integrated into the process more neatly. Maybe we can even think about whether we need all these checks. Because ultimately, of course, checks are not a, an end in itself. They're supposed to be a means to an end. Um, but we certainly need to be aware of these. Taking your sort of um, canonical vanilla pipeline and pushing it all the way through to production isn't something that I think is realistic for a lot of organizations right now. And I think that that's perfectly fine. I mean, just because the book says that you go to release, I think initially on our journey there, we have to be a little more circumspect about what kind of scope uh, of our pipeline we want and how we want to progress that or grow that over time. Okay, so it's not all bad. A lot of people we are on this journey and I think as I said that one of the best things I can try and do is impart some of our experience with helping organizations on this journey. Um, and so let's see whether we can come up with some kind of steps, a sort of toolbox if you like, uh, so that you know Together with this set of toolkits, starting on this journey, we can hopefully get closer to our, our happy customer that we're all trying to uh, help here. And I'm actually cheating because I think it's seven. Uh, but you know, you get two free. That's when I'm late. Um, all right, so we're not going to go through these. And again, some of this stuff might be blindingly obvious, in which case, great. I hope, in fact, that everything is blindingly obvious for everyone here because then we should really had no problems getting this stuff introduced. Um, but these are things that we've seen and we've learned from customer experience that um, can help. And if they're not there, they can make things difficult. So one of the key tenets of continuous delivery is that we move a uniquely identified or versioned package through the pipeline. So we don't do that. We'll build it in dev and then test it in dev. And then we'll build it again slightly differently for test. And then we'll build it again for QA because I was just saying to uh, some folks outside earlier, that's a bit like test driving a car for 12 you know, months or whatever in order to do all the safety checks and then submitting a different car for the certification. It doesn't make any sense. No. The whole point of the continuous delivery pipeline is that our confidence in what we're delivering grows as we get further down the pipeline to the point where we either make a decision that it's just not going to be good enough and we don't deploy it, or we think it's good enough and then our customers should benefit from it. But of course, that only works if it's the same thing that we're actually moving down the pipeline. So we think, I mean, some of the obvious ones, yeah, it's trivial to say that if you're deploying applications, you probably want the binaries to be part of this. But then there are some other things that your application will probably need that, depending on the organization, may or may not be part of that version packet. Database changes, uh, configuration files, server settings. You need to increase the max memory on your server in order to run your app. How is that handled right now? Is that just a set of change tickets that are kind of vaguely identified as dependencies or maybe listed in, in a JIRA ticket as dependencies? Or is that really some way where you can look at your package and say, when I run this particular version of the app, I need uh, max memory of one gig or more. Uh, dependencies on other applications, all these kind of things. If I want to deploy this app, I need to check whether these three other apps are installed. And again, you know, obviously, we had a look at probably a very similar kind of idea in terms of 
talking about this kind of stuff also for your systems themselves. But I think it's important from a delivery perspective that we look at where we're able to identify one thing that we're going to transition through the pipeline and that that thing contains all the components that we need. So I mentioned some of the, uh, the, the kind of pitfalls that are quite common here, environment specific builds, configuration settings that only really exist in change tickets, or simple things like smoke tests. And one of the things we'll see a little bit later in the demo, I think if we get around to that, is you know, if you know that you can test your app by pinging this particular page and you expect a certain response, you know, please put that in the package. Don't just have that walking around in a couple of testers' heads. Because then we can actually easily automatically verify whether the app is installed and actually working. All right, number two, pipeline stage checklist. I think KK, certain technologies like Jenkins pipeline stages map very neatly onto certain jobs. So that's fine, that's a, a technology specific thing. Ultimately, the pipeline from a principal perspective has a set of stages. And you need to, it may sound obvious, but you do need to think about which stages we actually want. Not just where we start and where we end. That's another important question. Now, are we going to make it to production or are we only going to go to QA? Maybe it's going to be different for every application. But we do need to think about which steps do we actually want in our pipeline. I don't think there is such a thing as the canonical pipeline that works for everyone. Uh, in some organizations, we might want to do you know, regression testing for these apps, or in some in others, or other applications, we don't. Uh, and it's not just technically what do we want to do in our pipeline. It's also who's actually responsible for each of the individual stages. And if this stage always breaks, for instance, who's responsible for checking what's going wrong there and actually making sure that that gets improved over time? Input and output, well, that's a very obvious one to copy, copy artifacts from workspace is one way of implementing that kind of stuff in Jenkins. Um, what should be the result? When does a stage trigger? So what are the conditions that mean a stage should start? Typically that's the previous stage is completed successfully, but there may be other triggers like time triggers or multiple conditions that need to be met. What are the preconditions for every stage? And by the way, you don't have to make notes about this unless you want to because I'm sure the slides will be available. Um, and this is, for instance, prerequisites or gates are a good point to put things like release management uh, conditions. Do I have a change ticket? Is the change ticket approved? Is it Thursday? Whatever the condition happens to be. Um, success failure criteria. Again, a pretty obvious one, but um, you know, if you're running a script, then it's pretty clear that it normally means if you're doing Unix and your sysadmins do their stuff properly, if I have an exit code of zero, we're good, otherwise we're not good. But there are many other different possible failure positions, such as do I see a certain entry in a log file, whatever. Uh, and then failure handling. If this thing goes wrong, what is supposed to happen? So the default would be disabled, we'll abort the pipeline at this point. But you may want to say, I want to you know, have some remedial actions. I might want to retry the step after making a certain change, um, whatever. So I think this is a, a very simple checklist, and I'm sure some of these things may or may not be more or less relevant, but uh, it's a good to, to have this information. So another thing that we didn't talk about is based on the prerequisites and the inputs and outputs, you can also start to figure out which parts of your pipeline you can parallelize. Uh, for instance, if you know the classic example is mobile app testing. Uh, of course, all the test stages depend on the app having been built, but in general, they don't depend on each other. So there's really no reason to run them one after the other if you can save all that time by running them all in parallel. And things like matrix builds and all that kind of stuff come in there. Um, and of course, the idea is that, as we said, we're not just building code, we're also building confidence levels. So when you define the output, you might want to say that the output of the regression test phase is, we believe that this application will run with customers using an existing version of our client or whatever. Um, and I think a very important one here, and something that's kind of maybe a, a second phase thing, but one that's often forgotten, is feedback cycles. Um, continuous delivery, like Agile, is an iterative process. And whilst there is a very strong focus on the from the beginning all the way to the end type thing, and then we're done, um, iterative processes improve incrementally by looking at you know what went wrong and learning from that. So if we have a failure at the regression test phase, what can we learn from that if that happens repeatedly about the previous stages? And how can we use that information to improve our pipeline over time? It doesn't have to be something that's static for all time, 
And we can change the phases, we can change the owners, we can change a lot of the things about the pipeline that we just talked about. Manageable units of work. Now, some of these things are kind of hard boundaries, so there's not too much we can do about all of them. But in general, obviously, if you have smaller tasks that are quicker to run, um, in general, smaller tasks have a faster runtime. Smaller, it's kind of hard to define what exactly what it is, but building a humongous application typically tends to take longer than building a smaller component of the application. And you have a very fundamental, very trivial piece of math. You could say that, you know, if the longest task in my pipeline takes six hours, then I'm only going to be able to do four pipeline runs a day. It's that simple. Um, unless they can run in parallel or dependent on each other. But in general, for that particular pipeline, that's going to be my max. So that might be fine. We might be happy with four runs a day. I'm not, I'm not the person to say you should be doing it every five minutes, but we should at least be asking ourselves, um, if we have a hard limitation in terms of the number of pipeline runs, um, are we getting right, the right value for money out of it? And if we feel that we want to run more often, we maybe want to deploy every 15 minutes if we can do it, then we obviously need to make sure that we also get those tasks down to the level that they're quick enough to make this kind of stuff possible. Oh, there was no, no, there was no second slide there. So the next one is scalable capacity. Um, so there's two dimensions to this particular uh, bullet point, I guess. Uh, and the one is, yeah, you're going to do a lot of pipeline runs. Ultimately, that means a lot of stuff needs to happen. If you think your average pipeline has uh, uh, maybe eight phases, say, and you have 100 applications, that's 800 potential tasks that need to be executed. You have a whole bunch of these executing at the same time. Um, and if you're running this on Jenkins, for instance, yeah, you're going to run out of, if you have a fixed agent pool, you're going to get clogged up pretty quickly. Um, unless you have Debit Cloud, for instance, which will do this for you. Yeah, but this is also one of the reasons you'll see as a bullet point in a second. Um, and the other thing is not just to run those tasks. It's also a lot of the deployment, a lot of the tasks in the pipeline, rather, will be testing tasks. Or they will be tasks that require a running application. Um, if you have a running application, you need to have an environment in which to run the application in. And again, this gets back to the contended environments problem from earlier. If you have a hard limit on the number of available environments, you also kind of have a hard limit on how many of these tasks you can run concurrently. So uh, you need to think about scalable capacity in two directions. One is just workers in order to run all your pipeline stages, and the other is have enough environments available in which to run your applications. And of course, you get the classic uh, demand spike problem here. Um, depending on you know, your pipelines, this is generally not a constant level of demand. It's great if you can do it constantly and all your apps are firing every 15 minutes, and then you can kind of plan for this nicely. But it's also nice to have the capability here to say, you know, I don't want to take care of you know, ordering the service in time and trying to figure out whether their utilization means they're cost effective and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to let somebody else take care of that. And then you go to KK and you have a chat with him, and he will tell you all about how that works. Um, Cloud-based services obviously offer themselves very, um, very nicely for this particular use case. Automation, automation, auto I'm not going to do the developers, developers, developers thing, don't worry. Um, but I am going to say automation, automation, automation. Uh, hopefully calm voice. Pretty important. It's not a prerequisite. I said this at the beginning. I don't think um, I'd be the person to stand up and say, if you're not fully automating every stage, then you're not doing continuous delivery. But I think the practice shows that it's pretty essential to get a lot of stuff automated. Just because um, human beings or manually executed tasks are slower and less reliable. Um, and that's fine if you're doing one of these every couple of months in your classic Big Bang release. I mean, it's not fine, but it's manageable. But if you're trying to do this every X minutes or every X hours, just the, 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 the capacity and the, the failure rate is just not tolerable. So basically, we need to think about doing quite a lot of automation. And I'm sure a lot of you in this room have already done a lot of this stuff. Continuous integration, the build part is automated. I'm sure there's a lot of automated deployment going on here, maybe through scripts, maybe through some public Jenkins. So we'll deploy customer here. Thanks for that story. Um, 
things testing. Testing t is a little bit the elephant in the room here because test automation is just hard. It's not for lack of tools. It's just for lack of time and money to invest in writing all those wretched tests, especially for applications that uh, somebody will recognize as the rubber chicken. I'll come to that in a second. Uh, especially uh, with regards to applications that have already been written. So it's really, really hard to go over and, and convince your management that you need another two months to basically change nothing about the application, but just write an enormous set of automated test suites. So I highly recommend, because testing really pays for itself like 10 times over, otherwise you're stuck on the plane and it costs a million quid. Remember that story. Um, if you're starting a new project, really fight for the ability to include automated tests. And sometimes automated tests mean you have to actually, it's a trade-off. Uh, some applications are written in such a way that they're practically impossible to test automatically. So it may impact your application architecture, it may impact your functionality, uh, but it is something worth fighting for. What I meant by this, the rubber chicken, the famous blog, I can't remember who wrote it, continuous integration on a dollar a day. Um, I think it scales to continuous delivery. It's basically saying that you don't need a whole bunch of complicated tooling for this. You can do continuous integration with nothing but an old machine, a rubber chicken, and a bell. And I'm not going to tell the full story, but I highly, uh, if somebody's interested, uh, just Google continuous integration dollar a day, and you will get a fun blog post. OK, so I talked about some of this stuff already. Um, build automation, I think, is obvious. All the test automation stuff, that's also pretty much standard nowadays. Uh, then we start to get into the areas that are not quite so common. Uh, we see a lot of deployment automation still manual, which is great for us, because that's our business model. Um, performance testing, all that kind of stuff. And then it gets to some ones that are even more interesting, if you ask me, but maybe a little bit more futuristic. Things like metrics gathering and feedback cycles. Um, there's one obvious level of metrics gathering, like monitoring. How many people have like monitoring baked into your application so you always know how well the individual components are functioning? People like AppDynamics obviously uh, do a good business of, of selling that kind of stuff. Um, there's another really interesting level, and we're seeing some automation appear on the market for that, which is quality gathering. Uh, metrics at the OS level, like you know, response time and that kind of stuff, are all very well, but they don't say a whole lot about how happy your users are with the software. And ultimately, that's what we really want to know. Um, and there are some companies that are doing kind of mechanical turf and, and other type of ways of automating the gathering of quality metrics about your application. And that's really, really important for the feedback cycle to figure out whether you're building the right stuff. So this is one I think from having seen KK slides that I think you also talked about. Jenkins is adding a whole bunch of stuff to try to make this easier as well. One of the things that's a bit challenging about a pipeline is that in your vanilla version, you basically have a lot of things that happen. Um, and all you can see by looking at the sort of standard dashboard is, did this particular stage execute or not? But some of these steps have well-defined, if you like, side effects. So in most organizations I've been to, um, there is this concept of an app running in a certain environment. So we know that once we've been through the deploy phase to test, that that actually means there's a side effect that an app is running in the test environment. But in order to actually look at the status of our environments and figure out what's running where, we sort of have to reverse engineer all the pipelines to try to figure that out. Um, which environments exist at the current point? You know, if one of your stages in the pipeline is, I'm going to create an on-demand environment, that means that at the end of that step, there's a new environment somewhere. And you know, those who've heard the dreaded phrase, um, what was it, environment sprawl, virtual sprawl, yes, that would be. They know of this problem because suddenly you have like a thousand VMs and nobody really knows who's using them and that kind of stuff. So I think it's important to, to keep track when you're doing these pipeline stages to, to make sure you update these kind of overviews or these dashboards or however you want to visualize it so that you know what happens to be running where, which environments are being used by which applications and when can they be destroyed. And obviously also you know, the test stages especially, well, their job is to increase the confidence level in your application. And it's quite nice to have a kind of red or some traffic light or some kind of indicator to show, for this particular app, this is our current confidence level. Of course, we can reverse engineer this by looking at the pipeline, but it's nice to be able to see for the 12 apps we have right now, we think this one's great, this one's well, a bit dodgy, and so on and so forth. So, um, as I said, you could do a lot of this re-engineering, but um, you know, something like this, this is just a screenshot from deployed. Of course, we try to show some of the kind of stuff. 
pipelines, environments, what's running where, and so on. Which ones are still blocked due to various re uh, release conditions? What kind of stuff is useful to have? Okay, release control. Um, as we start going further down our pipeline, we get into environments where it's not just so easy to hit some button, run some script, and suddenly stuff is running. In most organizations, there's a much greater degree of control of authorization and so on that's required. Um, and hopefully, we can uh, do some good automation here by linking these requirements to the prerequisites and gates that we were talking about in step number two. I mentioned those as some examples. For instance, um, I need a change ticket, or it has to be approved by the QA manager, or it has to have release notes, whatever these things happen to be. Um, I think a really important one here is not just to think about how what that link looks like, but also, uh, can we automate some of these? And especially, maybe we can get rid of some of them as well. Um, like, obviously, you can't get rid of the cab meeting. That's going to be tricky. But a check, does a change ticket exist for this application? I'm pretty sure everybody who's using a change management tool or Jira or whatever, uh, there's an API for all of these. So there's no real reason why you have to check this kind of stuff manually. Uh, and there is indeed no real reason why you're, you couldn't agree with your QA manager that you know, the way you're going to approve this particular application is not by sending me an email, but by setting some checkbox or setting the status of a work order to approve the whatever. And then again, you can hopefully integrate these in an automated way. So, there you go. That's just a recap, I think, of what I just said. Um, I think the interesting thing here is we want to fine tune the dial between throughput and control. The more control we have in general, the less throughput we're going to be able to achieve because there's going to be more conditions, people are going to be on holiday, all that kind of stuff. And that's fine, uh, but we have to be aware of this. It's kind of hard to have both. And, there's no, and every organization needs to find their own balance uh, where they're comfortable with this thing. Uh, and automation helps here. I mean, if you look at you know, the, the poster children, the LinkedIn's, they, you know, they run some crazy number of thousands and thousands of automated tests. But then they, they can do away with a, lot of the, with a lot of the release requirement stuff because their trust and confidence comes from all the testing. Um, and so I think we need to ask ourselves, well, and in some cases, yeah, there's not much you can do. You might be legally constrained. Uh, by certain requirements. But I think this is a discussion and a dialogue that really needs to happen. And that will help everyone find their own balance here. Okay, I think this is the last one. This is a, I said five, it's actually eight. Okay, three, my god. Um, now, as technical people, frankly, all we want to do is we want to know that stuff's working. That's cool. Unfortunately, there's usually a layer. And I have mine sitting in the back. So he also wants to be able to measure me. Um, so our bosses also want to know that we're getting better. So it's not just about you know, saying, oh, I've got this great pipeline, all works. And like, show me. Show me so that I can show my boss, and so on. And so one of the things here is um, it's actually quite interesting to think about what kind of metrics we're interested in here. So this is, I think, this is a question that we should be asking ourselves right up front. What are we actually doing this for? I said accelerate time to market, obviously. But that breaks down into a whole number of components. So I think what we want to do is we want to ask ourselves, if we're going to put a stake in the ground and try to measure how well our pipelines are doing, what are we going to measure them on? Are we going to measure them on things like throughput? It seemed like an obvious one. Uh, but then again, you might say, you know, we have hard upper limits because our applications are so complicated. So it doesn't make sense to try to say we want to do 15 pipeline runs a day if that's just not possible. Uh, failure rate, it's just a reliability thing. Um, it's all very well to do like a thousand pipeline runs a day. If 998 store at the second phase, then maybe you're not, you know, maybe there's some, something to be improved there. Standardization coefficient, I think, whatever that means. Um, now, I think the idea here is that, of course, pipelines are going to be different for different applications, some. But it becomes trickier to manage if you have a thousand apps and each one of them has a totally unique pipeline. So, you know, uh, how do you keep track? They're all a bit different. You can't really cross compare them, all that kind of stuff. So, maybe we want to say we want to try and work on standardizing our pipelines uh, and have a look what the deviation is and maybe try to cut down the deviation. Um, how variable are the pipeline runs? Uh, so, if I look at every run, how predictable is it that the run will be done in so and so much time? If there are huge spikes, in uh, or variations in the duration of these pipelines. Is there something about the infrastructure that I can improve? 
So there's a, a bunch of others here, and I don't, I don't pretend to know which ones are the right ones, but I think it's important that everybody thinks about how they're going to measure their pipeline and agrees as part of the project or the implementation. You know, this is what we want, and of course then we also have to figure out how to measure this kind of stuff. All right. We've been through those. Let me quickly summarize those. We talked about a complete artifact. So that's obvious. You need to have all the things versioned that you need for your application. We talked about a pipeline stage checklist. Figuring out what our pipeline should consist of and what each of the stages should be doing. We want to keep the units of work manageable if we can, uh, because that makes it just easier uh, to run pipelines more frequently. Uh, we should look at scalable capacity, uh, because otherwise we're going to find ourselves bottlenecked pretty soon. And that's both in the environment dimension and in the worker dimension. Uh, we should have a look at our degree of automation in our pipeline and figure out what the impact is uh, on our capacity. Uh, to try and keep a side effect overview so that we those data points that we want to keep track of that we can see easily without having to reverse engineer them. Uh, we want to figure out how to integrate release control so that we don't get into huge arguments with our release management team and make them happy and comfortable that we're having the right level of, of control. And we want to have a look at improvement metrics or general metrics for our pipelines so that you know, we know where we are now and we know where we're going and how well we're doing. And so I think if you have certainly the last point, you can start thinking a little bit about your journey to continuous delivery as a kind of maturity model thing. And you start by saying, we want to reach this level of maturity, and we can break that down into a couple of phases or, or steps, and then we can use our metrics to uh, try to get there bit by bit. And of course, this gets back to the feedback cycle question where we can see if one of our maturity model goals is that we do everything automated. And if we measure the level of automation and we find we have a high degree of non-automated tasks in these applications, that makes it very obvious where we want to go and improve things so we can get our feedback cycles uh, working. Okay, so this is the, uh, this was what you were going to see and you've already seen actually. But I think from an automation perspective, I know I've said that automation isn't essential, but it's certainly very, very important. Um, this is, I think, what we're seeing a lot of people trying to build right now, or already they've already built, which is even better. Um, so there's kind of four main components that they want to put in the automation. They want to have, um, you know, obviously, a cloud, a hypervisor, something to give you virtual machines. They want to have automation on top of that uh, to help them spin up their environments, manage them, make sure they're uh, always in a known good state um, they have Jenkins, so more something to do continuous integration, Devil Cloud, obviously another option here. There's some kind of orchestration on top of that. There's a whole bunch of different technologies. Could be a different technology, could be Jenkins itself with a whole bunch of the plugins. Um, it really depends a bit on your organization. There's some test automation, which is so variable that I'm not going to uh, place a specific label on that. And then, obviously, from our perspective, we'd like to have deployed in the deployment automation box. You've already seen two of these. And now, as a quick bonus, because you've done a lot of tech today, I'm going to give you a lightning demo of Deploy It. So you can see the last of the three there. And I think then we're up for some questions. All right, so, oh, a staffing meeting. I don't want to do that now. Um, so let's do the, the easy one first. I'll go back to Deploy It in a second. But we've over, had a lot of discussions here so far today about what you know, deployments can look like from Jenkins and a whole bunch of different uh, steps to do that. I'll show you what a deploy looks like using the deploy plugin. Looks like this. So that's all you need to do. Deploy will take care of the rest. There's a packaging further up where we build the complete delivery artifact that we were talking about. But from our perspective, the way we think about Jenkins or indeed all other continuous integration tools, deployment should be as simple as compilation. It's just a technical process that needs to happen. You shouldn't have to care too much about what exactly is happening. Though. We certainly don't want you to have to write 100, run this script, run this script, run this script, run this script, and then write all those scripts yourself. So we'll come back to this in a second. So this is what this looks like. So this is deploy. I'll show you the user interface because it's the easiest thing to demo. Obviously, as I just said, from an automation perspective, it's much more interesting to use the REST API or our command line integration. So that this just goes away. You don't see this. It's an automated process. That's, I think, the goal. There's lots of pretty pictures for your manager, obviously. 
those are important so that you can you know, show them how well we're doing. So this is some of the improvement metrics that we can work on. We'll talk about the cloud stuff in a second. This is a uh, uh, integration point that a lot of our customers use to, to interface with things like Puppet. Um, and so let's have a look by starting in our release dashboard. Uh, this is going to be a really lightning thing, by the way. So if you have any more interest, I'm not going to cover everything that's in the point. Please come up to me or Ford afterwards or Stuart, and we're more than happy to arrange a more in-depth demo for you. What we're seeing here is that for the pet portal application, which we're going to demo right now, uh, we've got a particular version running in the dev environment. In fact, that was just pushed in here by Jenkins. And we have nothing running in the test environment. So let's have a look at version 1.0 right now. These are the complete version packages, if you like. And uh, we can see 1.0, well, we could upgrade, we could downgrade actually 2.1 back to 1.0, but we're not so interested in that. What we're going to do is we're going to deploy this out to the test environment. Acceptance and production is still gated right now. There's certain release conditions that we haven't met. And again, of course, there's not just manual conditions that you can set, but also automated links here, as I was discussing. So rather than do that in one click, let me show you in a little more detail about how this deployment works. On the left-hand side, based on your access control level, so depending on which user you are, which team you're in, you can see certain applications. On the right-hand side, you can see certain environments. You can see this is a fairly trivial environment. It's got four, it's got a database, an app server, a web server, and a test runner. Um, and of course, these could be distributed over totally different machines. Public cloud, private cloud will handle things like load balancer interaction, um, multiple environments, hot deployments, that kind of stuff. So what deploy does now, and this is the sort of declarative aspect, and now my screen resolution is not too happy. So what we have on the left is the what. This is the package. These are all the components that we need. Obviously, we need an EF file. That's pretty obvious. So let's put the EF file on the JBoss. Of course, I can automatically map this. But you can see what we're building out now, this is effectively what the Puppet module does for you as well. Um, as you say, I want this to go over here. That is related to a certain sequence of steps that actually need to happen to make this work. And the nice thing about Deployed is that, of course, we have that as part of our plugins. You can configure it and tweak it to your heart's content. But this is all out of the box. So if I map all of these right now, you can see Deployed builds out this particular action plan, if you like, for you, so you don't have to do it yourself. And if you want to have a look what any of these things look like, you can see this is just a, a data source template. This is what we've delivered. It's actually free marker. If you want to change it, be our guest. But frankly, you don't really want to have to write this stuff yourself. It's an order 50 here, which indicates why it comes in the sequence where it does. So if we have a look at this particular script, which is a test script, this is, in fact, I think just going to invoke curl. This is order 102. That's why it's at the bottom. And this is what allows Deploy to interleave uh, very complex deployments. So what we find is that most users initially, they, they play with a plan analyzer for a while. Then they just get bored, and they simply start running their deployments like this. This is a deployment plan. Um, of course, each of the individual steps is just running here. We do the stuff that you'd imagine. We, uh, we're agentless, so that's something different to the technologies you saw today. We're logging in to these target machines using SSH or WinRM if it's a Windows box. Um, even Gartner recognizes that this important. And for those of you for whom Gartner is interesting, they recently published a report in this space, and they called out our agentless capability as being a unique differentiator, which is nice to hear if you invest some time in that. Um, it's actually, there's a talk at, at uh, Java 1 about the agentless framework as well. Um, so this all runs. This runs like an automatic transaction. There's rollback at every point. So what I'm going to do very quickly so that first we'll have a look at the application. We'll see the Tomcat status. It's a pretty pet clinic, and that's the Apache, and then behind that we have the pet clinic applications. Those of you who've worked with Spring will know this. If we have our dashboard, we can see we're now over at version 1.0. What I can do right now is I can upgrade this version to 2.0. So there are a few interesting things to point out here. This is exactly the same as dragging in version 2.0 in the test environment. So one of the interesting things about this is, if you notice, there's a much smaller deployment plan. And the reason for that is that deploy automatically does a delta calculation for you. Uh, which means that if, for instance, I go ahead and I change the data source setting, um, deploy will obviously adapt to that and make sure that the data source actually gets changed in the deployment. But most of the time in application deployments, especially the configuration settings, don't actually change. So if you have one of these WebSphere applications with 4,000 resources and variables and 
queue connection factories and all the lovely stuff that you can configure that nobody really knows what it's for, um, then you, of course, don't want to recreate those every time. It's incredibly painful. So you really only want to make the minimal amount of changes that are necessary. In fact, what we're seeing here, there's an automatic database diff as well. So we're only running the second script. What I'm going to do right now uh, is to demonstrate another thing. I'm going to add a, I'm going to simulate a deployment failure here. Don't show, don't show anyone that I've just changed that. That's only available to highly authorized users. Basically, first of all, we have manual steps as well. I know I said automation, 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 but the reality is that we have a bunch of customers who say, oh, no, now I want to send an email to someone and I want to get them to do something. Of course, we support that as well. Um, but what we're going to pretend here is that instead of that step number four actually being there, we'll pretend that step number five fails. Say so we time out trying to connect uh, to the Apache before we do the web content. So this is where we are now. Um, the thing's failed, and now we're sort of halfway through a deployment plan. Um, we've removed the web content. So if I go back to our, our Apache server, we should see that when I refresh this, there's nothing there anymore. Oops. We've already made the database change, and now we've timed out on the Apache. Now, the nice thing about deploy is, first of all, we can rerun from this point. So we can fix the timeout, we can wait, and we can continue, actually. We can even skip the step. And we find that in reality, a lot of deployments are recoverable in this way. This is really nice compared to uh, the script that I think I've written a million times. I'm sure a lot of people in the room have as well. There's very, very, unless you're using basic, go to 89. There's very few ways of getting a script to just rerun from an arbitrary point. Um, but the other nice thing that we have is auto rollback. So basically, we maintain effectively a database transaction as we do the deployment. And we use that to get a rollback plan for any given state in a plan. So notice that what we're doing now is we're running the rollback script that was provided for that database chain. Now, that's not magic. We didn't auto-generate that or something. That's provided as part of the package. We're going to replace the old web content that we've just deleted. And then we're going to run the old tests again to verify that once I've made these changes, the application is back in its previous state. And of course, if you want to do this from Jenkins, I'm quite sure there's rollback on error. It's simply that. That's all you have to do for any part of your deployment plan. That's kind of stuff that's hard if you want to do it yourself. <coughs> um, all right, so if we have a look, we're back to the old version of the application. Uh, so far, so good. And that's us done here. The only other thing I, well, I wanted to point out two more quick things. I did say something about trying to push an environment independent package through the system. And of course, we can only do that if we can handle the invariable differences between environments. So we can see here, for instance, that deploy allows you to tokenize essentially everything. Nothing magical about that. I'm sure you all do that a million times already. Here we have a token in the web content. Uh, we also have a token in the proxy pass definition. I think, in fact, we have a whole couple of tokens. And these are um, linked to environments. So a lot of people have conventions around this as well. They say, you know, we'll have environment name dot properties or whatever. We give you a slightly more flexible model so you can have multiple properties that override each other and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll show you deltas across different environments. Uh, we, of course, also keep a change history of each one of these. So if I now go and edit and I make that. Back there. there we go. And then if I want to compare Pet Clinic Dev with a previous version of itself, I can see that as well. So I have full change control over that kind of stuff. And who here has spent more than 15 minutes trying to chase down why that works in one environment and not another? Okay, so all of you will hopefully uh, find this kind of stuff useful. The last thing I wanted to point out is the cloud pack, There's something new in the latest version of Deploy. What this is all about is saying it's great, it's really important to have the capability to spin up environments on demand. Uh, and a lot of people with public cloud and environment provisioning and configuration management tools are getting really close to that. I still see a lot of cases where it's an off-centered activity. So you have to either make a change ticket or more realistically, you have to go three floors down if they're in the same building and you have to sit on their desk until they make that environment. And that's the last thing our DevOps people you know, ops would really want to spend their time on. So we're seeing a lot of interest in giving people the ability to do this in a kind of secure self-service way. So uh, this is just an just, in quotes, integration to uh, other things. So basically, you can choose an environment template. You can define those in the system. I know in my virtual environment. Uh, these environment templates, uh, well, 
you can support them on any cloud provider. By default, we support EC2 and vSphere. And then you're basically going to have a bunch of AMIs or virtual machines. And then you have Puppet or something, if you want to, running on top of that to do a provisioning step. And um, then we'll just make that environment for you. So we'll start all the, all the machines. Bit of a weird time up here. Basically, they're all started, they're async calls. So we make the request to start them and then we wait for them all to come up. And then you have a, an environment on demand that you can deploy to, like a regular environment. And then when you're done, you can pull it down again. And of course, even though we've just done this from the UI, more likely than not, you probably want to trigger this from something like Jenkins. And I know you've already seen the Puppet plugin from Jenkins, which can give you the same kind of functionality as well. And then when you're finished, yeah, you can tear the environment down. All right, so that's for that's that for a very quick demo. As I said, there's a, there's much more to talk about, but I'm not going to spend too much time about this. A couple of resources that are interesting. I mentioned the release trend survey a few times. Um, it's, it's been out for a while now, so some of you might have seen it, but if you haven't, it's really interesting to look at. Uh, I think it's mainly Fortune 1000 companies. But if, so if you're a technical person, it's a great motivational tool for your boss. If you're the boss. It's a great motivational tool for yourself. Um, we, we did a ref card recently preparing for continuous delivery that covers quite a lot of what I've discussed, but I think on more technical detail, um, it's really uh, worth looking at. And it complements the ideas, the principles of continuous delivery ref card really nicely, because that was all about how it can look like when you're there. And this one is really focused on what you have to do to try and get there. And then there's a white paper we have as well, and of course our website. So I guess with that, oh god, still staffing meetings. Oh, I don't want to do the staffing meeting. Anyway, um, so for more information, yeah, feel, feel free to go to the website. Of course, try it. You know, get get the stuff, get the automation up and running. Come up to speak to Stuart, me, Court, uh, some other colleagues in the room, bodies here as well, sitting over there. Uh, and that's my email address, aphillips at zvlabs.com. Uh, you can listen to. Oh, I haven't written a blog for too long now, but eventually I'll get around to it. Again. So thank you very much. <laughs>